level that uh, we don't ever want to experience. But, uh, so it is real, and we have some seasons in life, uh, of course, that it's going to be ups and downs, uh, it's going to be valleys. Uh, boy, I love that, I love both of those songs, by the way, and that last one, Let Me Tell You About My Jesus. Did y'all hear the testimony in that? Uh, if you, you're facing discouragement, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about... Hey, if we just have that... If we have that uh, purpose in our life, we'll be probably a lot less discouraged. Amen? If our focus is kept on Him. So I do encourage you that. With that as a backdrop, everything that discourages you, I'm not saying it's a fix for all of it, and there are some, some things, we'll, we'll cover this as well, but... There, there's some types of deep, dark discouragements and, and even depression that it can be physical. There's some physical, there's some emotional battles there. There's some mental things that, that goes on its way. Hey, I'm ne- I'm not gonna, you're not going to hear me uh, condemn you for being discouraged or even to the depths of depression and, and claim it's all spiritual because it's not. There have been people in the past that, that have uh, dealt with all depression, lumped it all in together, and then say, well, you're just fighting a spiritual battle. No, that's not necessarily true. You may be fighting a spiritual battle, but it can be physical. It can be a physical issue. Uh, but with that, as, as, just keep that in mind as we try to go through this, because there's no way we can cover all this topic in one week. We may come back and cover some more next week. I don't know. Uh, but being a born-again believer, this is something, as a believer, you need to make note of, okay? If you're a born-again believer, that does not exempt you from discouragement. Just because you're a born-again believer does not mean that you will never face discouragement. It doesn't mean that you'll never deal with, a, with depression. Uh, it doesn't exempt us. And here's the brutal truth of this. If you deal with depression as an unbeliever and you give your life to the Lord and you're, you're a born-again believer and you're saved, it, you may de- still deal with it, okay? It, it, again, it could be a physical, some vi- physical issues there as well. Uh, if you have a tendency to slip into a depression... Uh, it's a, it's a way of whether you're saved or not, you can still uh, experience those times. While a Christian is not exempt from battling depression, we do have a relationship with the one who can give us victory and can help us up out of the pits. He never promised us that we wouldn't be discouraged. He never promised us that we wouldn't deal with those valleys and those times. Matter of fact, he promised that we, we would. He promised that at some point you will, as a believer, face some type of discouragement. It's part of life, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's, part of, uh, it's part of walking out our faith. And let me ask you something. I mean, nobody wants to be discouraged. Nobody wants to deal with those valleys and those difficult trying times. But let me ask you this. Without that, without, be, without going through those times, do you think... Do you think God would ever get the glory in your life like he can through those valleys? Let me ask you another way. If you never have any valleys, you never have any challenges as a believer, what does that say about us to the world? They'll never see Jesus working in us. When they see you going through a valley, if you cling to the, to the hymn of Jesus, if you cling to him, and, and, and you allow Him to live in and through you through those dark times, you won't be able to see it then, but they'll see it. Your lost loved ones will see it. If you stay with Jesus, you stay with the Word of God, you stay with the stuff, you don't, don't leave your church family. That's the people that can minister to you the most. They don't have to have all the details, unless you choose one-on-one maybe to share it with somebody, but... When we're discouraged, that's when we need the church the most. We need our Sunday school classes. We need a, a godly... If, if you're a man, you need a godly man to help you with some of those problems and troubles. If you're a lady, you need a godly woman to help you 
through some of those trying times. And if, Lord help us, if we're not the church that is engaged enough to help people where they are, or at least attempt to. We may feel totally helpless, and we may, not, may feel like we're spinning our wheels and not being a help to them, but if we love them, we're lifting them up to the Lord, God is faithful to use us in their lives. And you may not say anything magical. I'm telling you, there's times I, I have to, as a, as a, as a preacher, that our biggest challenge is not saying something, it's shutting up sometimes. You know, when somebody's discouraged or dealing with uh, uh, some type of depression, it's not that we've got to have all the fixes, but we do take them to the Lord, and we do pray, and we do encourage, and we just love them. Sometimes it's just a matter of being there to love them and being available and letting them know we're available. We really mess up many times. I have messed up so much trying to say the right thing when God hadn't given it to me. Okay? So that's... didn't mean to say that, but that, maybe that'll help somebody. Uh, there are many causes of depression. There are many types of depression. We, we don't have all the, the time to deal with all those and trying to get in a lot of a deep... We, we don't want to get lost in the weeds, so to speak. But, uh, and I think I've got a slide for this, discouragement shouldn't be confused with depression. In other words, you could be discouraged, but not necessarily mean that you're depressed. I, if you notice when I said every believer will face some type of discouragement, but that don't mean that every believer necessarily faces depression. Now, I don't think you can be depressed without being discouraged, okay? But you can be discouraged without being depressed. Does that make sense? If, if you're with me, say amen. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Uh, depression, uh, depression tends to mess with our emotions a lot. Uh, it, it, can, it can take an extrovert and turn them into an introvert. If you ever notice somebody that's very outward in their personality, and all of a sudden, it's not there. They're not that way anymore. It may be, it could be, that they're battling depression. It could be that they're in a, a pit that they just don't know how to deal with, they don't know how to get out of. It can take someone with a great personality, someone who has great humor, and, and, and express, and it could be the most intelligent person in the world. It has nothing to do with whether you're intelligent or not. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you're educated or not. It doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or poor. It doesn't matter. Depression can touch us all. And it has, it is no respecter of persons. It can take someone who has great, is a great gifted person and in tournament of person that is doesn't even want to leave their house, doesn't want to leave their bed. It can strip them, so to speak, of many of their to to basically cause them to not be able to see their blessings. It can blind them. And I want to I want to present this to you. If some of the greatest people in history struggle with depression, then why would we ever think that, that it can't, couldn't touch us? Uh, this first picture I got, see if y'all recognize this guy. Oh, that's not a guy. Who is that? Abe Lincoln. One of the most well-thought-of presidents in our history, right? Not saying he's a perfect man, absolutely not, but well respected. Let me tell you something about Abraham Lincoln, in case you may not know this. He had two major breakdowns of depression. Once when he was 26 years old. Can you imagine? 26 years old, and again when he was 31. So we don't hear about that a lot. We see the success, we hear the famous quotes, and stories and, and and Abraham Lincoln by the way was uh, a, a, he had a great sense of humor great sense of humor 
I read a book about a bio about uh, of him, and it was, I'm telling you, it was it was awesome to uh, read about some of the stories he used to tell. And, and by the way, he he said uh, I've got a note here. It says he learned to battle his depressive thoughts by telling humorous stories. Does humor help? Uh, well, apparently it did him. Someone heard him say that if it were not for the funny stories and jokes, I would die. Wow. Here's the next one. See if you recognize some of the older folks and younger folks may not recognize this guy. Sir Winston Churchill. He called his depression his black dog. He was always, it was always there. Battled depression. But in Europe, especially England, that he, he's more, one of the most well thought of uh, men, during, especially during World War II, one of our leaders, uh, leaders of the Allies. All right, the next one, let's see if you recognize this guy. Now, one of our... One of our uh, one of our youth said that that was Einstein with a haircut. I thought that was pretty good. It's not Einstein with a haircut. It's Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Uh, he suffered bouts of depression. And a friend wrote that Twain had depression in his later years when his wife and three children passed away. And when his best friend when he lost his best friend. So he had a lot of losses. He, he, he battled depression. Rightly so. All right, I don't have pictures for these guys, but uh, there's some preachers, well-known preachers of the past. Um, some you may recognize. I'm just going to mention three right here, but there was a great uh, Puritan pastor of the past. His name was Richard Baxter. Richard Baxter. He lived from... 1615 to 1691, way back there. Baxter recognized the complexity of depression and anxiety. He pointed out that it wasn't sinful to face depression and that sometimes the body needed help to heal. And it's all, not always a spiritual problem like many thought. And many bef that came before him, they treated it like it was a spiritual issue and a spiritual issue only. Again, can be a spiritual issue, but it doesn't mean that it always is. Charles Spurgeon lived from 1834 to 1892. Well thought of. It known that he was called the Prince of Preachers in England, but he's well known around the globe and even to this day. And he was only 52 years old when he passed away. 52. And I say only because I've already passed that number. He was only 52. Uh, the main reason he gave, uh, the main reason he gave for his uh, open. Well, let me say it first. He was very open about his depression. He he was he would talk about it and he would try to help people. And the main reason he was open, so open about his depression, is that he wanted people to be patient with those who were battling the same things. Someone who who battled that and, and, and were dealt with all those emotions. He wanted people, he wanted his church family to be patient with him because he had experienced it himself. Uh, <clears throat> what brought on this? Why would, it bring, why would depression uh, happen to a, a man of God, a, a person of faith, a, a man that's in the Word, a man that's preaching the Word, being faithful to the Word? Why would he deal with that? Well, he, We'll get to that in just a moment, but he, he dealt with a lot of physical illness. Again, a lot of his was physical. He, had, uh, he, he experienced gout at 33. Painful gout. He had a lot of physical illness. Uh, he later had kidney disease, and he had rheumatism. All at the young age. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a Welchman, Welchman who lived from 1899 to 1981, one of the most well thought of uh, preachers of, of his time. 
He was a medical doctor who became a pastor later. He, he, he also wrote a, a book. I have it on my shelf, and it is uh, very helpful, and I offer that, loan it out to someone who needs it. But it's called Spiritual Depression. It's Causes and Cures. It's Causes and Cures. Lloyd-Jones taught people to trust Christ and not listen. To trust Christ in His Word and not your feelings. What do we see more than anything else in our culture today? Feelings. Emotions. I'm telling you, we have a whole world that's being driven. They're being directed by their emotions, by their feelings. I, and this is both funny but yet sad. I heard this statement by a well-known comedian. said he couldn't, wasn't even... He was struggling with even doing his act. Why? Because he said, there's, some, I'm, there's no way I can do my act without offending somebody. Comedians can't even do an act. And you can't even laugh about things anymore because of somebody's feelings. I'm telling you, it didn't used to be that way, did it? We have a whole world that is, they're just being blown like the wind. It, I'm telling you, it's like, a, it's like a, a sailboat without any kind of anchor. And the wind's just blowing it all over the place. If you, if you trust your feelings and you're motivated and you make decisions, emotional decisions, you're going to be tossed around like a boat in the ocean without any anchor. It, you're going to be blowing with the wind. And you're going to end up shipwrecked. One of our greatest... Old Testament prophets, Elijah, faced depression. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 8. This has always been amazing to me. It's very intriguing, very interesting, because here the prophet of God, he's just had the most amazing encounter. He has stood on Mount, I believe it was Mount Carmel, stood up on the mountain and, and was before all the people who had been dabbling, the Israel had been dabbling around with these, listening to the prophets of Baal, and they'd started uh, doing all this junk that comes along with worshiping other idol, idols and other false gods. And it just came a time where Elijah said, we're going to have a showdown. Elijah the only man at that time stood up against over 450 prophets of Baal and had this amazing encounter on the mountain. He, it was during a drought. And, and by the way, he had to b rebuild the altar because the altars were broken down, which shows a picture in itself where the people were. So he had to rebuild the altar. He put the, he, he put the sacrifice on the altar, poured it full, just poured water, soaked it with water, poured water around, dug a trench, had him dig a trench around the altar, filled it full of water. I'm telling you, he went through all of these steps and he let the prophets of Baal do their thing even before that. And then when he got a chance, he made his where it would have to be God. And he cried out to God and God sent fire from heaven, burned up the sacrifice, burned it to a crisp. He, and the, it says, the Word of God says the water was licked up out of the trench. And it wasn't, a, I believe, wasn't a dry spot. It, it wasn't dry anywhere. It, 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 it consumed the stones. It, I mean, it was God's fire from heaven. And then they dealt with the prophets of Baal by having them executed for leading the people like they did. But you know who those prophets answered to? It wasn't, just, it wasn't just about unknown gods. It was a woman named Jezebel. And she took it personal. And that's where we pick up here. Chapter 19. Ahab, <laughs> who was a king, who took his orders from Jezebel told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, 
May the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Now that may not sound so strong to you, but everybody knew Jezebel got what she wanted. And if she wanted somebody dead, they would end up that way. She was worse than the, the, the greatest hitman of the strongest mafia in the world. I mean, Jezebel was ruthless. But looking at the whole story for us, is it not hard to understand the prophet of God just faced off all of these prophets on the mountain and saw fire come down from heaven, wouldn't you think he would have all the confidence of God in the world to say, I ain't going to let one woman scare me. But he didn't. We don't know what all was going on with the prophet of God. It could be, this is just a thought, it could be that God removed a little bit of that protection from Elijah to prove another point. To, to, to prove to us today how much he loves and is concerned about his man. He didn't leave him. But Elijah wanted to die. He literally wanted to die. Uh, look down at verse... Four. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. How can a man of God get to that point? From the mountaintop to the gutter. Well, basically, in this case, ends up in a cave. Look at verse 5. Now, before we go to verse 5, let me, let me back up. I, I want to make this point first. As a believer, always remember this. No matter how, no matter what mountaintop you go to, like Elijah did, no matter what valley you go to, with somebody threatening your life or discouraging you, or no matter what you're going through, no matter what pit you fall into, we do not determine our finish line. Are you listening? You understand? No matter how much the enemy is on your in your ear or on your shoulder, telling you just curse God and die, like like that happened to Job. Like his faithful wife told him, just curse God and die. No matter how much discouragement gets told to you, no matter what, first of all, we're not to listen to that. And we don't have to listen to it if we belong to the God. Amen? We don't have to listen to that garbage. But no matter what is told to you, no matter what you have heard or where you find yourself or how deep a pit you find yourself in, remember, we do not determine our finish line. Now, we can call it quits, and a lot of people have. Suicide is at an all-time high. But for a child of God, as long as he says keep going and gives us opportunity to keep going, we're to keep going. And we're to lovingly encourage everybody around us. That's another reason the church is so important. That's the reason our families are so important. It's the reason we're supposed to be loving one another through all the difficult times. <coughs> uh, the Lord had, had a better plan for Elijah. Elijah couldn't see any future because he was stuck in the present. And there you have it. That's what we do. Whatever valley we're going through, whatever pit we fall in, it's our narrow vision because we can't see past where we are. And we get become so discouraged. But now, let me give you some better news. Verse 5 through 6. If you're taking notes, you might want to jot this down. He has resources from heaven. He has resources from heaven. 
verse 5 and 6. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. Behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Do you believe that God can supply you everything you need? Yes. We say that, but when we get stuck and we can't, we get stuck in our circumstances and, and, and in our thinking, and it becomes what I used to tell our tell teenagers when I, when I was in youth ministry, I said, <clears throat> we, be, we get to a place, if we're not careful, and all of our thinking becomes stinking thinking. If, if all, you can, all you can hear and see is discouragement, then it's a, good, it's a good chance that you're stuck with some stinking thinking. And you need to be praying, <clears throat> praying, asking others to pray with you. Because that's what brings on discouragement at a whole new level in our lives, and, and that's what causes us to get stuck there, is because we're not, we're not thinking about anything except our situation. We can't think outside of ourselves. And as long as our focus is there, we're, we're going to be stuck. <clears throat> well, if you're taking notes, the next point I think you would need to jot down would be He will provide for the journey. <clears throat> he will provide for the journey. And verse 7 tells us about this. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. Now, I don't know about you, but that just kind of jumps off the page at me. Do you think God will give you a journey that's too great for you? Yes. All this stuff, by the way, people take... take uh, Scripture out of context sometimes. You, how many times, and some of y'all may have said this and not knowing, I'm just going to help you with this, okay? When you say, well, you know, the Lord, the, the Bible says the Lord won't put on you more than you can bear. That's not true. It doesn't say that. I know what the reference is, but it's, that's not the same thing. It does, not, it does not say that the Lord will, put on, will not put on you more than you can bear. I see things all throughout Scripture that God put on thing, put things. He allowed things to happen, put things on people that they couldn't bear. But you know what? They turned to Him, and He did it through them. What about the Apostle Paul? God, God told him when they blinded him on on that road that day, blinded him and saved him, and took him to to uh, what it was it Ananias? Y'all help me with that. Ananias, right? And he told him that day, he said, I want to tell you about, God wanted me to tell you about the things that you're going to suffer for him. Ain't that a fine how do you do? You've been blinded. Is this some kind of cruel God? No. That's how, that's how people, when they take the Scripture out of context, and I'm going to tell you something. We may do it by accident sometimes, but there's a lot of people out there that does it intentionally. And they'll take Scripture out of context, and most of the time it's an atheist or somebody that thinks that way, and they just want to discredit the Bible. They think they can come up with something that somebody else hasn't come up with throughout history. The Bible stands on its own. It is proven. It is tried and true. And nobody living today, I'm telling you, nobody can discredit this, work, this, this book. They've tried. I'm telling you, a lot of people. If you know somebody that's uh, dis trying to discredit the Bible, you just you just say, "Man, I don't think you're any smarter than anybody else that's ever lived before you. I don't think you're going to come up with anything new." Uh, that's just a side note. But anyway, God will supply. He will supply. He will provide for the journey, and He will give you a journey that you need help on. You need his help to get through. 
life in general. Let's just look at things that we go through. My goodness. You let a death happen in your family, someone close to you. You let sickness hit. You let something happen. I'm telling you, we are nothing when it comes to some of the things we can face. We need Jesus. We need... No, let me back up. I'm not even wording that right. We have to have His power. We have to have His presence in our lives. And we have to have His strength for the journey. Because if it hadn't gotten hard, it will. You say, you're not being very encouraging. I'm encouraging because I'm telling you the truth. By the Word of God and by experience in this life, troubles will come. And He's saying that He will never forsake us. He will provide for the journey. Here for Ezekiel, I mean Elijah, I'm sorry. He provided for the journey. Now listen to this. This is just of my, one of my own notes here, but you may be an independent person. You may have lived most of your life depending on no one but yourself. But I have news for you. There are certain circumstances that God may allow to come to you come your way that will devastate you. You may find yourself alone to the point of giving up like Elijah did. You may want to give up. You may see no way out. And you may just want to call it quits and say, God, can I just die? Will you just take me out? Hey, we already have the promise of heaven, right? Had Larry singing songs about heaven and, and this the great news of the girls have sung this morning... Praise the Lord. I mean, if we got heaven waiting on us, should we want to get on and make the transition? You say, you're not going to be serving Kool-Aid in a minute, are you? No, I'm not. I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, we've got heaven waiting on us, and we can, we can have that to look forward to, but we can still become discouraged along the way. And we need to trust in Him. We need to lovingly trust Him and lovingly encourage those around us because we don't know who's in, who all's in the pit and in the valleys. <clears throat> uh, if you're not in a pit or a valley at the time, look for somebody around you because I'm about to guarantee you somebody around you is. Let's just hope we're not all in the pit at the same time. Amen? Uh, we're going to have to encourage ourselves out of it if we do. Uh, Next point, if God is with you, you're never alone. If God is with you, you're never alone. We have an enemy that's using discouragement everywhere we turn that leads to depression and it isolates individuals by having them believe lies. He will do anything to make us feel alone and worthless and unloved. If the enemy can keep us discouraged or depressed, what does that say to people who are lost? If we could just step out of our circumstances long enough to say, Lord, please, please don't let anybody around me that's lost see me acting like I'm hopeless because I'm not. You've told me you'll never leave me nor forsake me. Our testimonies become a contradiction. While we say we have surrendered our lives to Christ and He is now our Lord, we have an outlook of no hope. <clears throat> and on the surface, we look just like the lost and the hopeless. So the enemy always wants to separate you from those who have that God has given you. Think about your relationships. Think about whether it be your family, your neighbors, your church family. And I, I really I focus on the church family in this more than any because there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of family. There's a lot of people in a personal setting. A lot of people that that don't have uh, uh, those are, that can encourage them that is close by. And that's where the church family gets to be even more important. We must have one another. We must encourage each other. We must have that family, the church, and, and, and of course, godly friendships. 
But God has given us these relationships to bless us, to protect us, and to re enrich our lives. We must guard these blessed relationships for our good and His glory. This is a big part of claiming victory over these pits and these valleys this, uh, of discouragement and depression. I've told people, I've given this illustration probably several times since I've been here, so those of you that's heard it a lot, just bear with me, okay? Those of you that have probably heard this, and, and my wife's heard this probably way more than she wants to hear again, but as a kid, as a child, I loved, I think it was on Sunday afternoon watching Wild Kingdom. Y'all remember that? Watch Wild Kingdom, but uh, as a kid, I didn't think a whole lot about it at the time, but Man, later on as I became a, a, an adult and, and I started studying and, and, and thinking about how what Jesus has done to establish the church and how important the church is in our lives, and man, he gave me this application. And, I, and I, like, there again, I've used it many times before, and I just think it's a great illustration. But I remember seeing these lines, and they would, they would be hunkered down waiting on these little antelopes and uh, I think it was antelope and, and if, if, if it, there were ever uh, uh, like a there was ever a little sick one or a young one see there's two of them two different ones they focused on the most the lions would, would focus on the sick or the young right why would they do that easy targets what does that tell us? As soon as someone becomes a believer, we've got to help them grow and mature in their faith because they can't walk us this journey by themselves. They, they, they'll, they'll become an easy target for the enemy. And when you see somebody make a profession of faith and then they pull back away from the church, that's the worst decision they can make. They become an easy target for the enemy. I'm telling you, the devil has been... Has been uh, Named in Scripture as a roaring lion, right? He comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. And he's out. He's looking all the time. Whoever he can pick off. And here's something I noticed. That herd, <clears throat> they might not know the lions. They're so quiet. They might not know they're anywhere around. And all of a sudden, when they pick up on the scent, or they see or hear, they got such strong senses. Heads pop up. They start running, don't they? They run together. That's where their strength is. But guess who gets separated? If that if the lion can see that little one that's over here paying attention, he's a, or not paying attention, he's over here grazing by himself, he's out already further from the herd than he needs to be because he's not. he doesn't have wisdom, right? He hadn't been taught yet. He's still learning. And the lion, if it can get between, it's the first thing they'll do. They'll run, and they'll turn. The, the herd will take off running one way, and he'll turn that one that way. Then the other lions, they're ready. They're surrounded. It is amazing. And I'm thinking, Lord, help us. If we don't do what we can to get someone growing in their faith and protected from the enemy, because that's the first thing he wants to do is pick them off. So, verse 18, you're not alone. You're not alone in that Jesus never forsakes you. But He's given you tools. He's given you strength. He's given you the church. Make sure you don't allow the enemy to get between you and your church family. That's a warning. But look at verse, in closing, look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. Verse 18. This is after Elijah is winning and hiding. He's in a cave. He's fearing for his life. And this is what God's response is. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. This is after Elijah is saying, Lord, I've done this. I've, I've, uh, I've faced the, the prophets of Baal. We've executed them. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've been faithful but I'm alone. I'm the only one left. 
because Jezebel's had them all killed. I'm the only one left, Lord. He thinks he's the only one left. God says, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. By saying we are alone or or, or left to serve God and defend his name, we are saying he is dependent on us to complete his task. He's He's not dependent on us. And that's another, that's another lesson that Elijah learned that day. God's saying, Elijah, you're not only not alone, you've believed a lie. You're not the only one. Matter of fact, i got seven more. i got 7,000 more that hadn't, pro- they hadn't bowed to Baal, and I didn't use them. I'm going to raise them up. We're saying many times to God that he is helpless to fight against the devil and the devil's schemes. Isn't it amazing what we're really saying with our actions? So when the enemy comes, tries to separate you from God's family, just say no. No way. not going to allow you to do that. He starts bringing up some kind of controversy between you and somebody else in the church and, and you maybe allow some anger to build up, stop right there. Go to that person and talk to them in love. Don't allow the enemy to get between you and your church. <clears throat> when, he tries to is- <clears throat> Excuse me. when he tries to isolate you from your family or your friends and attack your mind, say no. When, when he tells you you're poor and worthless, Tell him you belong to the King of Kings. And your Father, He is your Father. And He loves you very much and you're part of the royal family. Tell him you belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I tell you what, I I can't hardly think about this or any other time of... of, uh, of, uh, personal attacks from the enemy without thinking about Mephibosheth. Y'all remember that story? Mephibosheth was... He, he, I don't need to go into all this. It's, it's too long. But that's a message by itself. But Mephibosheth, by all rights, should have been executed because when the next king came in to replace his family, he would have been the first one to be killed. And instead, he was preserved because of a, a promise that King David made to his friend Jonathan, because that was Jonathan's uh, brother, I think it was. But uh, th- th- this, was a, this was a man that was crippled. He was crippled, which is another reason that they, would, they wouldn't have helped him or done a, just done away with him, right? But, but the whole picture here is undeserving, but yet gaining everything. At the end of that story with Mephibosheth, by the way, I may preach that again for long. I love preaching about Mephibosheth because it's about hope. It's about not, not doing anything on our own but gaining everything. At the end of that story, we have a mental picture of a poor old crippled man by life and how the brutality of, of changing the... Uh, royal lineage and, 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 and all this stuff happening that he would have normally been executed, we see him at King David's table. Pulling up to his table because King David said, you're going to dine at my table. From here on out, you're going to eat with me. And you see this picture of this poor old crippled man sitting at the table. He couldn't help himself. He couldn't defend himself. But he came by invitation. Just like when we're invited to come to Jesus and we accept the invitation, we get a seat at the table. Not a table, the table. And I'm telling you, with that comes great blessings. And with that, we need to be reminded and look outside of our circumstances when we're discouraged and we're hearing things from the enemy, we need to stop him and we need to stop and say, wait a minute, you're telling me lies. 
The things that, the way things look, it doesn't say everything. I'm a child of the King. I belong to Him. And someday I'm going to sit at His table for eternity. And we won't have to hear that anymore. We won't have to hear the lies. We won't have to deal with the pain. And Boy, I tell you what, maybe we need just a celebration service sometime, Larry, where we are singing all heaven songs. Maybe I, might, I may not even preach that Sunday. We, th- let's work on that. We're, we're, we're just singing songs of heaven. Would you all do that? And if you don't sing, I'm going to preach. But if you'll sing... And we just celebrate. What about just a celebration service where we're just singing about heaven and we get a little bit of glimpse of glory? Wouldn't that be good? Y'all pray about that. That might happen pretty soon. All right, everybody stand.